Down from the northern coastline of Tasmania runs the broad green valley of the Tamar. Here many an early settler came to build a home and graze his flocks along the river's fertile banks. Here in 1833 came Captain Matthew Friend to live beside the peaceful river a mile or two from Launceston. Newnham Hall was the homestead that Matthew Friend built, a comfortable, spacious house in the fashionable colonial style, set back a little from the water with a solid barn of brick. A pair of cottages for his shepherd and his plowman, and parklands shadowed with great pine and cypress trees. But through the following years, as owners came and went, the fortunes of the fine old property swung with the four winds. At last, in 1940, three men stepped from Newnham Hall into the sunshine, and the future of the old estate was clear once more. Three men, an education officer, an architect, a teacher. What did they want with such a place, with 180 acres of land? They planned, as leaders of the Launceston Progressive Education Group, to build a school. For in recent years, their city had spread its suburbs and factories far and wide and filled its schools to overflowing. Through the foresight and tenacity of Percy Hughes, then education officer for the district, the government approved the scheme and the property was purchased. After the war, when the school leaving age was raised to 16, and the idea of the modern school was emerging, it was clear that what Launceston needed was a secondary school with a community basis. Building started, and in 1948, the school was opened. The pioneers had returned to Newnham Hall. Pioneers, that's the word all right. There were five of us teachers at first, we started with 160 children, 180 acres of land, and goodness knows how many problems. Three classrooms had been built before the school was opened, but even they hadn't been completed. Still, nobody minded that. We were starting something new in Australian education. We expected to improvise. We swept out the cobwebs and turned the old barn into an art studio. A wooden shed made quite a serviceable school office. And in the wool shed, the sound of singing took the place of shearing. More buildings were underway, of course. Our classrooms, homes we call them, are spaced informally out among the trees for quietness. So when the school is finished, it will be like a well-laid-out village. Our children will have the same freedom and opportunities as their country cousins in Tasmania's area schools. After all, if a school is to serve the community, then it surely must be a community in itself. As time goes by, the school will merge more and more into the outside world, because it's planned not only to be a school, but also a district community centre, with a theatre, swimming pool, playing fields and so on, a recreational and cultural centre that the people of Mowbray the industrial suburb just outside the school gates, will be able to share with their children. The idea has caught on locally, and we've already had a lot of help from various organisations in developing the grounds. Perhaps one day you won't be able to tell where the school ends and the community begins. That's what we hope. During our first year, the school received the name the G.V. Brooks Community School, in honour of a former Director of Education. Our plans steadily marched forward. Two more classrooms were completed. The domestic and technical buildings went up and also the arts block. And our numbers were rising all the time too, from 160 in 1948 to over 500 today. Every morning, the Union Jack and the school flag are run up and we start the day with assembly under one of the old oak trees that Matthew Friend planted. We sing a hymn and have prayers, 
There may be two or three announcements for me to make. Then we all listen to a little good music before the day's work starts. Tasmania's secondary education system provides high schools and technical schools for those children with a well-defined academic or technical bent. But two-thirds of our children need a less specialised education. It is these boys and girls who make up the backbone of our community. And it's the job of our modern schools to discover and cultivate their interests and talent. Character develops this way. Happiness and good adjustment follow. All the facilities are here for children to find and follow their deepest interests. Our vocational guidance system allows them in their final year to work one day a week in the city as apprentices in whatever career they may have chosen. The idea being to give them a foretaste of their future work. There is plenty of cooperation. The boys do shoe repairs for the girls, collect the eggs or the milk for the cookery classes. Then in return, perhaps the girls will wash the boys' football jerseys. All this work will help the boys and girls in their married life later on. For the more husbands and wives cooperate and share each other's interests, the happier they will surely be. Many of the things the children make help to improve and beautify the school or the community outside. We believe that our personal talents should be used for the benefit of our fellows. About one third of the children's time is spent in the home arts course because we pay a great deal of attention to homemaking. We even have a complete model home to teach the children the principles of home planning and design. Children are so very susceptible to their environment. As their teachers, we feel that we cannot do too much to improve the school in any way we can. They work alongside us, and we take a common pride in each new step forward. Art and music are two of the most popular subjects, and we hold quite a lot of classes in the open air. With us, the accent is always on informality. Our curriculum is not academic, and so we only need enough classrooms to accommodate about half the school population. To encourage children to think for themselves, we have an annex to each classroom where they can work independently, tackle their own problems. In a school like ours, social studies naturally is a very important subject. Today, the world probably needs clear-thinking, well-informed citizens more than it's ever done in all its tangled history. Those citizens don't just grow. We have to train them. That can't be done just in a classroom, of course. We organize many group projects and outside visits to stimulate the children's desire for knowledge, to give them insight into the world beyond our gates. The children get some practical experience of the working of democracy through their school council. Each class in the school elects four councillors, and the office bearers are the mayor, mayoress, clerk and treasurer. It continually amazes me the way they keep school affairs running smoothly. I get invited along occasionally if any knotty point crops up, but that's not often. These boys and girls know how to think for themselves, and it's not every adult who knows how to do that. The problem under discussion this afternoon concerns some of the work on the school farm. One of the biggest problems our farm manager has is how to cope with the number of boys who want to do farm work. The bigger his problem is, though, the happier we all are, because it shows that the drift of country folk to the city can be not only checked, but even reversed. We have 90 acres of farmland, and the farm makes a very considerable contribution to the school's income.
The boys learn the principles of animal husbandry, crop rotation, pasture management, and other aspects of scientific agriculture. It does your heart good to see the city children coming into contact with the soil and its fruits. Even if they don't all turn out to be farmers, then at least they'll have a good working knowledge of country life. We always have several acres of land under vegetables, and these come in very useful for the cookery classes. Then there's a nursery of young trees and shrubs which are planted out to ornament the school grounds. We like to feel we're carrying on the tradition of tree planting that Matthew Friend began over a century ago. Surely boys and girls who spend their school years in these peaceful surroundings will gain an appreciation of nature's beauty, a desire for self-expression, and zest for life under the Tasmanian sky. <laughs> The motto of our school is everybody work, everybody help. And judging by the progress that's been made in four years, it's a motto that everyone has taken to heart. It will be a lifetime probably before the school is developed to the full, as far as plans and constructions are concerned. But you don't judge a school by its buildings. You judge it by the children it produces. Children are the true wealth of the nation. We must prepare them for life itself, just as carefully as we prepare them for their job in life. As teachers, we ask ourselves, will these Tasmanian girls and boys take a sense of service into life with them when they leave? Will they know and seek the best and highest? Will they have breadth of mind, as well as self-assurance, integrity, and independence too? We like to think they will. <laughs>